right. So um, I was hoping that you would show people your protocol for testing uh, your conductivity meter and making sure that it's accurate and then um, what good methods for keeping care of your conductivity uh, thing are. All right, for starters, I'll show you what I have here. Uh, we have the conductivity meter here. I have the cap removed and it's been soaking in distilled water for at least a half an hour, as per instructions from the manufacturer. We also have uh, a couple of bottles here. One of them is a filtered lake water sample that I use as a control sample. And another one is a standard reference material that I've made from sodium chloride. Uh, that I can use to calibrate the device uh, every time I use it. And finally, we have here a water sample from White Lake. And then we also have some distilled water as well, right? And I have some distilled water for rinsing purposes. Uh, I would recommend using distilled water over deionized water because deionized water may have some residue in solution. Uh, so it's a better idea to use distilled water. It's the same price and uh, it's, it's, um, you're more likely to have a much lower blank value using distilled water. So with the distilled water, what value should we expect from our conductivity meter? Well, I've been getting about one microsiemen with it, uh, sometimes two, uh, less frequently zero. So it's very, very small compared to uh, a measurement of say 100 microsiemens. So it's a good blank. So if I got a one or a two with my distilled water, would you be worried about that? Nope, that's just fine because there's always some residual amount of conductivity and water itself ionizes a little bit. So there's always, it's very, very hard uh, to get uh, water that is completely pure and free of ions. Uh, you would have to have a special distillation apparatus uh, which would be very expensive. But for our application here on lakes, citizen science, this is just perfect, just okay. fine. Great, okay, so how would you go about checking your conductivity meter? Well, the first thing I would do is I would uh, take a little sample cup, like you have, if you're going to see your physician, and pour out a little bit of distilled water. I would take my device that's been soaking in it, place it in it, and turn it on. You can hold it like that if you like. You just have to make sure that the electrode is completely submerged in water, because if it's not, it will not be working right. So the device takes measurements for a period of a few seconds, and if it's changing, it takes an average. And in this case, the number, I believe, is one microsiemen. It says two. Or two. Okay, I'm not looking at it, but... Uh, Right, so that's good. So we're ready to measure a sample. So I bring it back into the other distilled water container. And the next one I'm going to measure is my reference standard. The reference standard I made by weighing out sodium chloride, which I heated in the oven for a while to remove any residual water. I weighed out a certain amount, 10, 10 grams of sodium chloride, and then I dissolved it in a liter of water and then I did some serial dilution to bring it down to a concentration of about 100 parts per million NaCl. So I would take a sample of this. So what, what do we expect this sample to read? Well, uh, about 188 microsiemens. And what's microsiemens? Siemens is a measure of conductivity. It is uh, the uh, it's measured between two. It's the conductivity measured between two square electrodes, uh, one centimeter held one centimeter apart. Okay. So we see the temperature at the bottom there. Does that matter? Yes, it does. Uh, I've found that um, in the normal temperature range, say fifteen to 25 degrees, you don't have to worry so much about the temperature. But if the water is very, very cold, uh, this device, I think, has a hard time compensating for that. So it's better if you've got really cold water to take the sample, bring it home, let it equilibrate uh, to room temperature, and then do your series of measurements. If it's warmer uh, during the summer, then it's perfectly good to go and, um, and uh, 
take measurements in the field. Okay, so let's see what the reading we got here. 189 at 20 point, is that 7? 20.7? 20.7 degrees. So 189, that's pretty close to your 188. Absolutely. How do you feel about that as far as calibration? Well, I think that's really, really good because it's much less than 1% close to the value. So. So what would you do if it was very different? Well, if it was very different, I would take note of it and uh, make a correction against the values that I measured. Say it was off by 15% uh, highs, for example, I would take my measurements and I would reduce them by that. Okay. Um, now, we're only doing a single point calibration curve. Strictly speaking, you should be doing a number of points across a fairly wide concentration range. but. I picked the concentration of this standard because it's very close to the concentrations I'll be measuring in White Lake. So I can get away with doing a single point calibration and it'll be good enough for purpose. Yeah, and this is this is what we're, we're suggesting with the Water Rangers um, calibration as well. And this, the, the calibration solution is similar to what Conrad has here um, so that you will do a single point calibration. And uh, we, we will give uh, how to calibrate the machine in another video. Okay. Yeah. Right. So now we've had a look at, at uh, the concentration of our reference standard, and we're happy with that. We'll have a look at our control sample. Now, control samples are used because quite often you don't have access to large quantities of reference material. Once you've used the reference material for a measurement, you should never return it back to the bottle because it's contaminated. So you leave it aside. And if you want to make a bulk sample, you could take liters of lake water, for example, and filter it and just keep that as a control. You measure it over and over again and you have an expectation of what the result will be. So in this case, I've been measuring this and it's been close to 200 microsiemens every time. So now I rinse the electrode in distilled water for a while and I put it back in and it's taking a measurement there. I stir it a little bit to make sure that there's no residual distilled water left close to the electrode. So now I'm measuring the sample. 200. I have 200. So that is exactly what I was expecting and I'm happy to see that. Okay, now we're ready to do a measurement on a lake sample, which I collected a few days ago. You chipped a hole? Chipped a hole in the ice and got a sample. So did you do a, a test in the field as well? No, I didn't do a test in the field because the water is at zero degrees. It was just too cold. And so I brought it in and waited until it warmed up. Okay. Let's have a look. 197? 197. So that seems about right? That seems about right. That's in keeping with the measurements we've been taking on the lake. So it makes sense that this is right. So if you're doing a large number of samples, what I would recommend is between samples to rinse the uh, electrodes in distilled water and then do a number of samples. And every now and again, every 10 say, do one of your control samples to make sure that it comes out right because you can always replenish this, make a new control and measure a number of values so you know what to expect. So you know that if you have a high value, you go back to your control samples, it gives you the right number. You have more confidence that the measured value in your sample is correct. Cool. And do you have any sort of final advice for people about why conductivity is an interesting parameter for them to be testing on their lake or river? It's very interesting because uh, it's one that is easily accessible to the citizen scientist and you can learn so much about your sources of water into your lake uh, and you might be able to find a source of pollution yourself, uh, which would be really interesting. So how would you find a source of pollution? Like well, what would if, be, how, how would you use conductivity for that? Well, if you're taking measurements in the lake or in your river or stream and you find that as you move upstream the value changes considerably and you find a stream coming off of that or you can trace it back to 
a location in front of a cottage or a dock or something like that, you might be able to find something that is releasing something into the water which maybe shouldn't be there. Okay. And uh, finally, I just want to say thank you, Conrad, for all your help in explaining conductivity um, and all your good advice on making sure that your tests are good. My pleasure. So my advice to everyone is to go out and take some measurements.